Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my honor today to introduce Dr. Runkoda uh, for today's graduate seminar. Dr. Koda received his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Maryland. Prior to that, um, he was a postdoc fellowship in material science and engineering at the University of Michigan and a system professor in mechanical engineering at Colorado State University. He received the 3M Non-Tenure Faculty Award in 2019, the NSF Career Award in 2018, the George Elbel Outstanding Early Career Faculty Award in 2018, a Teaching Accent Award from the Colorado State University in 2016, and the Summer Faculty Fellowship from AFORSR in 2016. His work has so far resulted in six patents and about 48 journal publications, which was cited more than 3,600 times. With that, please join me to welcome Dr. Arun Koda. Thanks, Jun. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, share some of the research that uh, we have been doing in the past, uh, over the past few years in my research group. And the seminar uh, series is a great idea. Uh, I echo uh, the thoughts of some of the previous speakers where um, especially the younger and newer faculty are getting to know um, what all is happening in the department, the different, the vibrant research happening in the department. So um, I hope I'd be able to uh, add the little drop to the ocean uh, through my research. So we're gonna be talking about tailoring solid liquid interfaces today. So um, um, we're, we're, I'm gonna tell you how, when a liquid droplet comes in contact with a solid surface, um, how can we tune or tailor that interface? And uh, before I take a deep dive, I'd like to acknowledge all the support that I've got, gotten from various funding agencies, all the collaborators without whom uh, this work would not be possible. And most importantly, my uh, students. Uh, this is an older picture, but uh, it, it has the, some of the main people that, uh, uh, whose work I'll be talking about. They're currently alumni of the group. Um, uh, Wei Wong was my first postdoc. He's now an assistant professor at University of Tennessee. Ahmed Wahabi and Sanli Mawafagi, um, both of them are uh, my, uh, the first two PhD students. They're both during, doing their postdocs and uh, uh, very interested in uh, getting into academia. So it's primarily these three guys' work that I'm going to be talking about and some of the things that we are pursuing now is what I'm going to add to it. So um, getting into tailoring solid liquid interfaces, I want to give you a quick overview of the different configurations that we look at when I say tailoring solid liquid interfaces. There could be liquids that come in contact with solids where liquid droplets are sitting on top of uh, solids, or there could be solids that could be sitting on top of liquids. It could be like things that are floating on solids, micro robots or dro water drones that are floating on liquids. It could be uh, liquids that are flowing past solid surfaces where, uh, um, you know, we can look at applications related to drag reduction and stuff. There could be phase change happening when uh, a liquid or a vapor comes in contact with a solid surface in terms of condensation or vape, uh, uh, evaporation or boiling. Or there could be uh, two different solids and in between we might have a lubricant or a gel uh, a liquid or a gel in between. So these are the different kinds of configurations um, that, that we look at when I say solid liquid interfaces. And our goal is to tailor them. By tailoring them, what I mean is we try to look at the solid um, and we try to change the micro and nanostructure of the solid uh, or the modulus of the solid or the chemistry of the solid, the molecular ordering of the solid the charge, the uh, so on and so forth of the solid. And from the liquid standpoint, we try to change the liquid properties like density, surface tension, viscosity, um, you know, the polarity of the liquid, the conductivity of the liquid. And in, in doing so, we try to uh, either, uh, we, we try to both look at the fundamental phenomena occurring at solid liquid interfaces and also tune uh, whatever uh, properties we are trying to get to suit a certain application. So that's the big overview of uh, the research that, that's been happening in my group. And then um, I'm gonna be talking about four different thrust areas today. Um, 
I, I'm going to start with the super repellent surfaces. These are surfaces that are extremely repellent to liquids. So this is a, a, a fabric where you can see liquid droplets that are um, just sliding off of the surface. The, the uh, surfaces are uh, so repellent or the coatings on the surfaces are so repellent that the liquid droplets don't want to stick. They just slide off of the surface. And so I'll talk about the fundamentals of uh, how to design these super repellent surfaces and talk about some of the applications of these super repellent surfaces. Then I'm going to be talking about the stimuli responsive surfaces. So as the name suggests, these are surfaces that respond to an external stimulus, whether it be light or heat or electric fields or the type of solvent that, in, that it comes in contact with. And I'm going to be talking about what sort of applications uh, can these stimuli responsive surfaces be used for. Then I'm going to be talking about these antithrombotic surfaces where, uh, so um, antithrombotic means to uh, reduce or prevent blood clotting. So thrombosis is blood clotting. So we'll talk about how these uh, surfaces that can repel blood can uh, actually reduce uh, thrombosis or blood clotting and uh, the, the phenomena um, uh, that are embedded within that. Then I'm gonna be talking about the applications of these super repellent surfaces to thermal and fluid sciences, where we look at uh, droplet coalescence on uh, surfaces, droplet splitting on surfaces, and what are the scaling laws behind uh, uh, such phenomena and how such phenomena can be used for uh, enhancing uh, phase change heat transfer. So that's uh, that's the uh, that would be the final part of the talk, and hopefully I'll be able to get through all of this uh, within the given amount of time. So I'll start with super repellent surfaces and the basics of super repellent surfaces, and then we'll work our way through the rest. So let's start with the very fundamentals of wetting. Um, so when a liquid droplet comes in contact with a smooth solid surface then the angle between the tangent to the liquid air interface and the solid liquid interface is known as the Young's contact angle. And this Young's contact angle is uh, a function of the solid surface energy, which is a property of the solid only, the liquid surface tension, which is a property of the liquid only, and the solid liquid interfacial energy, which is a property of both the solid and the liquid. Now, uh, if you look at this equation, it doesn't take very long to uh, realize that if I want to get a high Young's contact angle, I need to have low solid surface energy. Um, so that is the reason why when, whenever we, we have uh, uh, coatings that are non-stick or that are, uh, um, you know, that are repellent to uh, liquids, we tend to use low solid surface energy materials like Teflon and waxes. That is part of the reason why, uh, why our non-stick uh, frying pans at home are made with Teflon, because they have low solid surface energy. Now, based on the contact angles of water on solid surfaces, you can classify it as hydrophilic if the contact angle is less than 90, hydrophobic if it is greater than 90, and super hydrophobic it's, if it's very, very high, much higher than 150 degrees, the maximum being 180 degrees, where you get a perfect sphere. Now, with any chemistry that we know of as of today in, in this world, we can make hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces, but just using chemistry with a smooth surface, we cannot make super hydrophobic surfaces. We don't know any chemistry that has low enough solid surface energy that results in super hydrophobic surfaces. But in nature, there are many examples of these super hydrophobic surfaces. Lotus leaf is one of the most commonly cited example. There are many, many more. So you can see this water droplet that's beading up. It's just colored blue. It's beading up and these, this water is very easily sliding off or slipping off of the surface of the super hydrophobic um, lotus leaf. And the reason why we see these surfaces is, uh, I, I told you that it cannot be made just with chemistry. And the additional thing that they have is roughness on their surface. So they have these uh, micro scale and nano scale roughness on the surface and that surface contributes towards this extreme repellency um, that, the, uh, that the surface shows to the liquid. Let's understand what this roughness does. So when a liquid droplet comes in contact with a rough surface, so this is my uh, rendering of a rough surface, it can either get into the pores 
or there can be air trapped between the liquid and the solid surface. These are the two possible states. Uh, the one on the left is called the Wenzel state. The one on the right is called the cassie baxter state. Now, if liquid gets into this Wenzel state where the liquid is completely filling the gaps between the solid, then the liquid is sort of interlocked between uh, the solid and it cannot move very freely. Unlike what I showed earlier on the lotus leaf, liquid cannot move very easily. And because of that, we are not interested in this Wenzel state. Now, if we look at this cassie baxter state, there is air trap between the liquid and the solid. And this results in very high contact angles. Let's understand why that is. Now, if I just a quick thought experiment, if I asked any of you, there is a, let's say there is a liquid droplet and that's suspended in, the, in mid air, um, in the middle of uh, uh, air and we can ignore gravity, let us say. And I asked you what would be the shape of that liquid droplet pretty much every single one would answer that it would be a perfect sphere. Now, if you look at this liquid droplet in this cassie baxter state, all around here, you have air. Now, if you start putting more and more air at the bottom as well, then this liquid droplet is going to feel like there is air all around it. And so it's going to beat up more and more, and it's going to take more and more spherical shape. And that results in higher and higher contact angles. So bottom line, if we want high contact angles, which is what we want to design a super hydrophobic surface, we need this Cassie Baxter state with as much air trapped as possible between the liquid and solid. And that's captured by this uh, Cassie Baxter equation. Now, when I uh, showed you that lotus leaf uh, video, I also showed you that the droplets are moving very uh, easily past the surface. Not only is, uh, are the liquid droplets beating up, but they're moving very easily past the solid surface. They're slipping past the solid surface. And that slipperiness is because of a property called uh, low contact angle hysteresis. So let's understand what this contact angle hysteresis is. So whenever a liquid droplet comes in contact with the solid surface, it has a maximum contact angle and a minimum contact angle. It's ne almost never a single contact angle. There is a maximum value known as the advancing contact angle and the minimum value known as the receding contact angle. And uh, the reason this contact angle hysteresis even occurs is because of inhomogeneities on the solid surface. So there could be physical inhomogeneities like roughness on the solid surface or chemical inhomogeneities, meaning there could be differences in surface chemistry from one spot to another spot. And because of those, we get this contact angle hysteresis. And the difference between these uh, advancing and receding contact angles is what's known as the contact angle hysteresis. Now, this contact angle hysteresis, it's a very uh, strong function of the interfacial, solid liquid interfacial area. If the interfacial area is low, then the liquid doesn't feel the inhomogeneities as much, so it can lead to low contact angle hysteresis. Now, if I showed you three different uh, uh, um, you know, structures, a microstructure, a nanostructure, and a hierarchical structure, which means the nanostructure is superimposed on top of this microstructure. And if I asked you which one has the lowest solid liquid interfacial area, it won't take you very long to figure out that the liquid only contacts at a few points here and a few points here on the hierarchical structure. So hierarchical structure has the lowest solid liquid interfacial area. And because of that, hierarchical structures result in low contact angle hysteresis. And so in other words, if I can have this hierarchical structure, I can enhance the repellency, meaning I can enhance the ease with which the liquid droplets can slip past the surface and so I can enhance that super repellency. And this is the idea that the lotus leaf uses, that nature uses, where it has a micro scale roughness and it also has this nano scale roughness. And the combination of these two, uh, so on this micro scale is where these nano um, needles, wax C needles are. And the combination of these two is what repels in this high degree of slipperiness. And the low solid surface energy of this wax C needles, the hydrocarbon chemistry of this waxy needles also results in high contact angles. Now, a few years ago, Coca-Cola had contacted us and said, uh, hey, we want to make uh, uh, coatings 
that can prevent the sticking of their uh, Coke Cola syrup, the, the syrup before the Coke is made, um, that is sticking to the stainless steel pipes and tanks that they had in their plant. And they said, can you make a coating that can reduce the adhesion of uh, uh, the, the syrup to the stainless steel material so that they can minimize the wastage that they're having? And then the, the constraint that they put on us is it has to be made with a material that is generally recognized as safe by the FDA. So then we started thinking about what kind of material can we use? And it was actually an undergrad who came up with this idea uh, where he said, why don't we make it make these super hydrophobic coatings out of an edible material? So he proposed, uh, why don't we make it out of butter? Butter is an edible material. It's hydrocarbon chemistry based. So it's a, uh, uh, low enough in solid surface energy. So uh, we tried to make it with butter, but then butter was melting too easily. Then he went to a nearby uh, a whole food store and he picked up this beeswax and he took this beeswax. He uh, made a suspension of that beeswax in uh, water and then he spray coated to create some sort of a texture on the surface. And when we coated uh, different types of cups, uh, with this texture on the left, you see an uncoated cup and on the right, you see a coated cup. You'll sort of see how much uh, the, the difference between the wastage. You have a significant amount of this liquid sticking to the cup where you have, uh, you know, where you don't have the coating. But when you do put the coating on, you, you do see a significant reduction in that wastage. And so, uh, with an edible material, we were able to show some uh, coating that can reduce the adhesion. Of course, uh, it was not possible for Coca-Cola to utilize this coating in their plant. And the reason there was the durability, the mechanical durability of this coating was not sufficient. Uh, but the general thought process is, if we want to make a coating that can reduce the uh, adhesion, we can choose certain edible materials to make uh, these coatings as long as they're durable enough, they can still be uh, utilized for such an application. Um, now, I, uh, I'm gonna switch gears and go from super hydrophobic surfaces to what are known as super omniphobic surfaces. And I'm gonna define this in just a minute. So on a super hydrophobic surface, on a lotus leaf, uh, which is an example, water droplets bead up uh, and they can be repelled. They, they slip past the surface very easily. Now water has very high surface tension. If I instead put an oil droplet, which has oil has low surface tension, if I put an oil droplet on this lotus leaf, then the oil droplet spreads on this lotus leaf. It cannot bead up on this lotus leaf. Now what we were interested in is doing one step, taking this uh, one, one level uh, and making coatings that are one level better than what nature provides us. We wanted to make surfaces that are extremely repellent to virtually all liquids, whether it be high surface tension or low surface tension, whether it be liquids like water or oils or organic solvents or uh, acids, bases, and you know even oligomeric liquids and stuff. So coatings that can, uh, or surfaces that can repel virtually any liquid are what we are uh, um, defining as super omniphobic uh, liquids. Phobic means repellent, omniphobic means repellent to everything, and super omniphobic means extremely repellent to any, everything. So the difference between these super hydrophobic and super omniphobic uh, uh, surfaces is in the type of texture uh, in, from a design standpoint. And so let me explain what the difference is. So on the left here, I'm showing you a texture that is tapered upward. And on the right here, I'm showing you a texture that is tapered downward. So this is a, a, a concave structure. This is a convex structure. Now, when a liquid comes in contact with the solid uh, in the Cassie-Baxter state, with the air trapped between the liquid and the solid, this liquid air interface is stable if and only if the Young's contact angle is less than the text, uh, sorry, is, is greater than the texture angle. So what I mean by that is, uh, and um, just to be clear, uh, compared to this texture, the entire liquid droplet is probably the size of the room that you're sitting in or the size of this entire building that you're sitting in. 
So we are talking about on the micro scale or on the nano scale locally, when this liquid air interface comes in contact with this texture, it's going to display the Young's contact angle. And this liquid air interface is stable if and only if the Young's contact angle is greater than or equal to this texture angle. Now, if it is less than this texture angle, the liquid air interface would have to curve upward. And that's an unstable state because the pressure inside the liquid droplet under normal conditions is going to be higher than the pressure outside. And this sort of a curvature is then going to be unstable and the capillary forces acting will act downward and they'll pull the liquid into this pore and they'll fill up this entire pore. So because of that, if we want to have a stable uh, configuration, we want to uh, have this Young's contact angle to be greater than the texture angle. Now, if this texture angle is greater than 90 degrees in this example, then only those liquids that have very high Young's contact angle that are greater than 90 degrees can be stable on this type of a texture. Or in other words, only high surface tension liquids which have high Young's contact angles greater than 90 degrees can be stable on this type of texture. So these types of textures can be super hydrophobic because water has high Young's contact angles on uh, low surface energy chemistries. <coughs> now, if you see this um, texture on the right here, the texture angle is less than 90 degrees. Now, when the texture angle is less than 90 degrees, it can support uh, liquids that have Young's contact angles greater than 90 as well as less than 90 as long as the Young's contact angle is greater than the texture angle. And so this type of texture can then support low surface tension liquids which have low uh, Young's contact angles and also high surface tension liquids which have high Young's contact angles. So these types of textures where this texture angle is less than 90 are known as re-entrant textures other words used in literature are overhang textures, undercut textures, so on and so forth. And there are many examples of this uh, reentrant textures. You can think of cylinders and spheres. If you look at the cross section, they have this undercut to them, or you can have overhang structures like nails and stuff. So wh whenever you have this undercut or overhang, those types of textures are known as reentrant textures. So now if we want to get supraomniphobicity, we need Cassie-Baxter state with all liquids. And if we need to get Cassie-Baxter state with all liquids, we need a combination of reentrant texture and low solid surface energy. And this idea has been utilized over the past uh, <coughs> 10 years or so significantly, including my research group. And this is a polyester fabric that I'm showing you here. And this polyester fabric by virtue of uh, the, the uh, bundles, it has that re-entrant texture because they're cylindrical in nature. And on top of this polyester fabric, we coated it uh, with uh, fluorinated silica particles. So these silica particles, sit, you can't see the silica particles on the, on the polyester fabric, but uh, these are nanoparticles of silica that are coated everywhere. And the fluorination results in low solid surface energy. So the combination of that re-entrant texture plus that low solid surface energy results in many liquid droplets, whatever liquid uh, you want to choose virtually any liquid, it just beads up and it slides off from the surface. Now, uh, after we made those more recently, what uh, we have been doing is we, we made these tapes, these super omniphobic tapes, where uh, it's very much like a scotch tape. You can put it on whatever surface you want. And these tapes have this super omniphobic uh, uh, property to them. They're made with this fluorinated silica particles. And you can take the tape and attach it to whatever surface you want, and then you would impart that prop, the supraomniphobicity to that surface. And um, here I'm showing you a concentrated sulfuric acid droplet that's bouncing off of the surface uh, on a supraomniphobic tape. And here it's a, you know an uncoated uh, aluminum surface that's uh, you know immersed in concentrated sulfuric acid and a superom uh, aluminum surface that is wrapped with this uh, supraomniphobic tape immersed in concentrated sulfuric acid and you can see there is no damage on the supraomniphobic surface. So the idea here is you can use this for uh, chemical shielding purposes. 
We've also um, made uh, metal surfaces, super omniphobic. So uh, this is a metal surface. We've used laser engraving to create uh, different uh, kinds of uh, reentrant textures. And upon fluorination, um, you can you can make the surface uh, super omniphobic, where you, you can see water droplets that are colored blue that are beating up, and also hexadecane droplets. This is a representative oil. It's a hydrocarbon. It's an oil. You can see oil droplets also beating up on the solid surface. And you can even see jets of this oil that are bouncing off of the surface and not adhering uh, to the surface on these stainless steel surfaces. So bottom line, um, you know, once we have the understanding of the fundamental physics, which is the combination of this reentrant texture and the low surface energy, um, then uh, you know the lab pretty much becomes a playground where you can combine these two uh, aspects and you can create these super omniphobic coatings on a wide variety of materials. So um, I'll now move on to the next topic, the stimuli responsive surfaces. So what I I had a choice to make uh, you know uh, when I when I was preparing this talk. Um, whether I wanted to go deep into one particular aspect or whether I wanted to give a broad overview of uh, different things that are happening in the remaining three topics. So I chose the latter. I am going to give a broad overview, but I want to say that there is a significant amount of physics and mathematical principles involved in each of the things that I'm saying, although I'm going to skip quite a few of those. And I'd be happy to take any questions at the end of the talk or uh, an extended discussion afterwards to, uh, you know, to go through the detailed physics and uh, math. So let's start with the stimuli responsive surfaces. So we'll first start uh, with photoresponsive surfaces, or in other words, surfaces that respond to light. So we made these uh, titanium dioxide uh, <coughs> nanoflowers. So these uh, nanoflowers, they have the reentrant texture, and once we fluorinate or treat it with a low solid surface energy, then we can make a super omniphobic surface and you can see a whole bunch of liquid droplets uh, beating up on the surface. Now there was a reason why we chose titanium dioxide. It's because titanium dioxide is photocatalytic in nature. W what I mean is if you shine UV light on this titanium dioxide, then electron hole pairs are generated and those electron hole pairs can interact with the chemistry on the surface and they can degrade that chemistry. So by shining UV light, you can tune the chemistry on the surface or degrade the chemistry on the surface to some extent. Now, I'm showing you uh, pictures of uh, water droplets and oil droplets on the surface. When there is no UV treatment on this titanium dioxide, you can see water and oil droplets are beating up quite a bit. But as we increase the UV treatment, excuse me, the, the, um, the droplets are they're, they're, try, they're spreading more and more on the solid surface. Now what we, and this, this is already very well established, this is all known before. What we identified was between the water droplet and the oil droplet, the contact angle hysteresis was changing differently uh, as a function of this uh, UV light. So for high surface tension droplets like water, the contact angle hysteresis, which is a measure of the adhesion or the slipperiness of the uh, droplet on the solid surface, uh, that was not reducing as much, but for lower surface tension liquids, the adhesion was increasing pretty drastically. So, which said that, uh, you know, by exploiting that uh, differences in the adhesion, we may be able to detect the surface tension of a certain droplet, meaning high surface tension droplets have very low uh, adhesion and low surface tension droplets have much higher adhesion at the same degree of uh, UV uh, treatment. So based on this idea, my first PhD student, she came up with this uh, uh, idea of a little uh, sensor, where she said, if I take this titanium dioxide nanoflower surface and I tilt it relative to the horizontal by a certain angle, and I treat different parts of this uh, titanium dioxide surface with different amount of UV light, then I can control the degree of adhesion. So uh, going from the top to the bottom, if I create uh, domains with increasing amount of adhesion, then if I put a high surface tension droplet like water over here, 
it may roll past all the so all the domains because it has low adhesion to the different domains if i start putting slightly lower surface tension droplet it may roll past the first three domains and it may get stuck in the third dom in the fourth domain and then if i reduce the surface tension even more it may roll past the first two domains get stuck in the third domain so on and so forth so in other words what we can do is we can take up unknown liquid droplet depending on where it stops we can detect the surface tension or estimate the surface tension of the droplet and that's exactly what uh, she demonstrated where you have this uh, uh, titan dioxide nanoflower surface where we patterned different domains with different degrees of adhesion and as we reduce the amount of uh, reduce the surface tension by increasing the amount of ethanol added to water then you can see droplets are getting stuck in higher and higher domains um, and, and in this manner you can sort of sort droplets based on their surface tension now the immediate question one one uh, would have is it's nice uh, you know you are able to sort the droplets by surface tension but what are you going to use it for so uh, that's where we are uh, now working on developing a fuel quality sensor so what i mean by this is uh, a, a sensor that detects the amount of uh, uh, contamination in a fuel so in many developing nations one of the major issue uh, is uh, uh, the uh, prime grade fuel say uh, gasoline or diesel it gets contaminated by a subsidized fuel that the government offers so uh, there is a lot of black marketing that happens now the current uh, way of detecting that contamination at the gas station is by density measurement if we take diesel and kerosene kerosene is a subsidized fuel and diesel is the prime grade fuel that's used um, they, their densities are too close to each other to have a very quick measurement and say that the densities are different of the uh, density of the contaminated fuel is different but it, with surface tension we can detect that more easily so what we said is if we can create this little prototype which is uh, this is just a 3d printed prototype and uh, machine to have different angles of tilt and if we take just a few droplets of the fuel and uh, put them on these different uh, surfaces depending on where on which tilt angle the droplet slides and which tilt angle the droplet does not slide we can very quickly estimate what amount of diesel and what amount of kerosene there is in a certain uh, fuel mixture so that is one direction that we are currently uh, working on then i'll move on to the next uh, thermo responsive uh, surfaces so um, here what we did was uh, um, we took shape memory polymers and we made uh, these mushroom stra shaped structures uh, which have reentrant texture to them this overhang gives them the reentrant texture and on the uh, when, once we have these uh, shape memory polymers and we heat them and then uh, deform the structure and then cool them down we can trap it in a, uh, a shape where these pillars are all collapsed and these collapsed pillars if we heat them back we can get this uh, we can recover the original shape so we have these uh, upright pillars they can be collapsed by heating and shearing and then uh, upon reheating we can recover the original pillars so what we did was we studied the wetting dynamics on these surfaces so on the upright pillars we have very low adhesion between the liquid and the solid you can see this air trapped between the liquid and the solid and uh, once you have collapsed pillars the per unit area you have more solid liquid interface and because of that you you uh, we tend to get low adhesion Uh, sorry high adhesion and then once you uh, heat and recover the pillars you uh, reduce the solid liquid interface area and again we get uh, low adhesion uh, to uh, between the liquid and the solid this is a video here if you can see this yellow box that i uh, that i'm showing it's actually a video where it's showing these pillars that are lying down uh, coming back up as we are heating um they're recovering and you can see the air pockets starting to form and we studied the wetting dynamics uh, associated with it and in terms of applications our uh, thought process here was um we because we can uh, embed whatever shape we want within this shape memory polymer we can encrypt a certain kind of a pattern in there 
erase it and uh, you know again re-encrypt a different kind of a pattern and that pattern will be visible only if you dip the surface in a liquid so uh, to develop rewritable patterns was one of the uh, directions that we were going in when we did this work then uh, uh, more recently we have been working on uh, electro responsive uh, actuators now uh, there are many um, we, we saw in the last uh, talk uh, by uh, GN where uh, there were different kinds of actuators uh, that are currently available. And um, with these actuators, the, the focus usually tends to be on manipulation of solid objects. What we asked is, can we instead use the actuators to manipulate liquid droplets? So what we did was uh, from the available literature, we just chose a certain manipulator. It was a, you know, we, we a PDMS uh, um, um, embedded with a twisted conductive coil. Um, so basically if we apply an um, electric current to this coil, then the coil would want to expand much more than the PDMS and the differential in the differential thermal expansion results in torques that are getting generated and that's that's going to result in actuation and this is very well established in literature so we just took that uh, those types of actuators and coated the surfaces with uh, some of our super omniphobic coatings and uh, what you can see here is once you apply the uh, the voltage the actuators bend and they can pick up the droplets and they can move to whatever uh, location we want and they can mix it with another droplet. And so in essence, what we have done is in a lossless manner, the droplet over here without zero loss, we can move it to another different location. The same thing can happen under gravity without the use of all these actuators and movement. Just under gravity, you have a droplet over here, you have a droplet over here when the actuator uh, uh, moves because these surfaces are super omniphobic the droplets immediately uh, slide and uh, they can mix in the middle. The same thing can also happen sequentially, one droplet at a time um, to conduct uh, whatever uh, you know reaction or <coughs> whatever analysis is needed on the solid surface. So currently we are collaborating with Ashley Brown in uh, biomedical engineering, where what we are saying is um, we have this surface um, and we have this uh, device and this device can not only manipulate, uh, uh, it can manipulate most liquids that includes biological liquids. It could be, you know, uh, it could be blood, it could be urine, it could be any biological liquid. So if we have an infectious biological liquid, I mean, we are going through COVID right now and uh, you, know, you all know, I, need, I don't need to uh, tell you all how difficult it can be to, um, you know, to come in contact with uh, infectious biological liquids. So if we have an infectious biological liquid, um, we can prevent human intervention when, when these droplets have to be uh, moved, say a blood sample or a, um, say a urine sample, and you want to detect a certain, um, whatever is the biological agent that you want to detect uh, in, in a certain biological sample. Um, then without human intervention, we can use these to manipulate the liquid droplets and um, make the mixing happen, so on and so forth. So currently we are working with Ashley Brown's group to look at blood samples so that we can look at um, clotting kinetics, so on and so forth, uh, using these uh, devices. So um, with that, I'll move on to the next topic, um, you know, anti-thrombotic surfaces or surfaces that can um, reduce uh, um, clotting, reduce or prevent clotting of blood. So whenever there is an implant that is placed in our body, whether it be a heart valve or a stent or a LVAD or whatever, any blood contacting implant that is placed in our body, then blood recognizes that as a foreign body and then proteins absorb, then uh, platelets uh, adhere to the surface, platelets activate, so on and so forth. There is an entire blood clotting cascade that happens and uh, blood immediately encapsulates uh, or fairly quickly encapsulates uh, this uh, um, device and it results in significant amount of clotting. The current state of the art uh, treatment for that is whoever has any blood contacting implant in their body, 
they are given blood thin uh, they are given blood thinning medication or anticoagulation therapy now our thought process was can we reduce that clotting of blood so what we said is why don't we make a surface that is extremely repellent to blood and we called it super hemophobic and so um, if we can somehow tune the super hemophobic surface such that when blood is flowing past the super hemophobic surface there is a certain characteristic contact time between blood and its components with the surface and there is also a characteristic time associated with proteins uh, absorbing on the surface or white blood cells or red blood cells or platelets adhering to the surface if the contact time associated with the movement of the blood past the surface is going to be much lower than the characteristic time scale associated with protein absorption or blood platelets and uh, cells sticking to the surface then we can reduce the clotting because blood doesn't feel the surface as much so we can reduce the clotting and that was the thought process so we took titania surfaces um that are currently used in stents titania is one of the most commonly used blood contacting implant material and we grew nano flowers and nano tubes on the surface and we fluorinated them so that uh, we can impart low solid surface energy and <clears throat> once we uh, fluorinated them they became extremely repellent to blood you can see whole blood beating beating up here blood plasma beating up and water beating up and this is uh, blood droplets that are sliding past the surface very very easily they're sliding past this nano tube surface very very easily so then we looked at uh, platelet adhesion on the on on these uh, different structures and uh, <clears throat> these are fluorescent microscopy images uh, that are showing the uh, platelet adhesion and on an unmodified titanium dioxide surface you can see a significant amount of platelet adhesion but when it comes to nano tube you can see a significant reduction in the amount of platelet adhesion to the surface and that's a first indication that this strategy can potentially work now we are uh, collaborating with uh, prasad dasi at georgia tech uh, to study the hemodynamics when blood is actually flowing past the surface does this still hold true or are the uh, the shear stresses involved in the blood flow are they uh, conducive uh, to the overall uh, uh, platelet adhesion um, so on and so forth to this blood clotting cascade or not and also we are doing animal studies with this where we are taking these uh, uh, these uh, surfaces and implanting them in collaboration with murli uh, padala at emery we are implanting them in sheep models so that we can uh, uh, look at uh, long term um, uh, response of these surfaces when they come in when they are in vivo so that is one direction uh, that that we have been looking at and we we look at how uh, you know the changing the interfeature spacing between these nanotubes the size of the nanotubes the different chemistries that we can attach on this nanotubes uh, to look at how that influences the uh, blood uh, clotting process more recently in the past year or so we have been looking at these uh, counterintuitive hydrophilic and slippery surfaces for the same purpose for um, blood clotting and reducing blood clotting so let me explain why i say hydrophilic and slippery is counterintuitive so if you take any hydrophilic surface just think of glass that you have uh, you know glass windows and stuff if you put a droplet of water it's going to spread and if you take that surface and tilt it vertically make that vertical the droplet is still going to remain stuck to the surface and that's because between water and the surface there is a significant amount of work of adhesion um, between a hydrophilic surface and water droplet now when you have surfaces like this very close to the surface on conventional hydrophilic surface very close to the surface within a nanometer or so you have what's known as the hydration layer it's a thin layer within a nanometer or so from the uh, surface where the water uh, molecules are fairly um, immobile so because of that what happens is when proteins come and absorb on the surface they don't have uh, because there is almost no mobility in the water molecules very close to the surface 
when proteins adsorb on the surface, they cannot desorb easily. They, they just get stuck and you have significant amount of adsorption and that adsorption continues to increase. Now, what we made in our lab recently is uh, these slippery and hydrophilic surfaces. And the reason I say, and I, I call this counterintuitive because on a regular hydrophilic surface, on a conventional hydrophilic surface, you don't expect the droplet to slide off when, when a droplet spreads that much. So what we made are these surfaces where the droplet spreads, and even if you tilt it by a little bit, tilt the surface by a little bit, in this case, I think the uh, surface were tilted by about four or five degrees relative to horizontal, and the droplet, the water droplet was is sliding off of the surface. Now, what we hypothesize with these uh, surfaces is that at the solid interface where you have the hydration layer, we hypothesize that there is significant mobility of uh, the liquid molecules. And when the liquid molecules are mobile at that solid liquid interface, in a, in a, uh, from a fluid mechanics standpoint, what we are saying is we, re we are relaxing the no slip boundary condition. So um, because of that, we, we have significant shear stresses at this interface when the droplets are, uh, or the molecules of water are moving uh, past the surface. So when a protein molecule comes and adsorbs on the surface, because of the shear forces that are at this interface, they can dislodge that protein molecule from the surface and thereby reduce the protein adsorption. So now the reason why I focus so much about that protein adsorption is in many, many uh, biological applications, uh, whether it be blood clotting or otherwise, one of the first steps that uh, that initiates the remaining biological processes is adsorption of proteins. Now, if we can cut off that step or at least impede that step to some extent, then we can we have some hope that the subsequent steps can be cut off as well. So, here I'm showing you a couple of videos. These are uh, obtained in turf uh, microscopy. Uh, basically, these. Uh, there is a protein called fibrinogen. Um, it's a predominant protein in blood that, uh, uh, which is responsible for clotting of blood. And so uh, this, fi this fibrinogen is fluorescently tagged and we are looking at the fluorescent image here where you can see on a conventional hydrophilic surface within a few minutes, the, uh, the entire surface is almost covered with this uh, fibrinogen. Now on uh, the slippery hydrophilic uh, surfaces, even after a one full day, there is barely any protein adsorption on the surface. So that's a significant advance in surface science uh, uh, as far as the biomedical uh, um, so, uh, biomaterials is concerned. Uh, there are no surfaces that can, uh, that can impede protein adsorption by almost a day. So currently we are uh, collaborating with Keith Weninger in physics, where he looks at single molecule protein dynamics. We're looking at different types of proteins and how they adsorb and the kinetics of that protein adsorption and desorption, the dwell time of each protein, and the, you know, the, the lateral and the normal diffusivity of these individual protein molecules on the surface, um, so that we can better understand the design principles behind these slippery hydrophilic surfaces so that uh, we can put uh, one. We can un uh, we can develop even better slippery hydrophilic surfaces, and also um, how they can be put on different uh, types of biomedical devices um, will also come out of uh, the, this uh, uh, the insights that we get from this collaboration. So um, that's about the antithrombotic surfaces. Now let me move to the final part of the talk. <coughs> I'll start with uh, this uh, phenomena that was uh, observed um, back in 2009. It was at Duke University, Boreco and Chen. What they observed is if you have uh, two droplets, uh, two water droplets on a super repellent surface, on a super hydrophobic surface, and they coalesce with each other, then the resulting coalesce droplet jumps up from the surface significantly with a, with a much higher velocity um, uh, than the, the, the coalescing droplets. So the idea here is when two droplets become one droplet, the overall surface area is decreasing. And when the overall surface area decreases, the surface energy decreases, which means 
compared to the initial state uh, state of two different droplets one droplet has lower energy and that excess energy has to be somehow released and that excess surface energy if the adhesion losses are low like on a super repellent surface the adhesion between the liquid and solid is low if the viscous dissipation is low meaning the coalescing droplets have low enough viscosity then the excess surface energy will get converted to kinetic energy and that's why we are seeing these two droplets getting uh, they're, they're coming together they push against the surface and jump up from the surface and that's really what's going on here now one of the applications that has been proposed for uh, this uh, uh, coalescence induced uh, jumping of uh, droplets is uh, enhancing condensation heat transfer so what uh, uh, researchers had this is work that uh, came out of uh, <coughs> evelyn wong's group at mit so where they said if you have a condenser and you uh, coat it with the super hydrophobic coating and vapor uh, is condensing on this condenser so that you have liquid droplets that are forming on this condenser when liquid droplets are close enough they can coalesce and they can jump away from this uh, condenser and so they're creating new area for more vapor to condense so in that process in in that sense you're enhancing the by enhancing the available area for new vapor to condense and become liquid droplets you're enhancing the rate of heat transfer so the the drawback with this approach is the efficiency of the heat transfer is very uh, efficiency of conversion of this uh, surface energy to the kinetic energy is very very low and because of that this strategy works for water droplets but if you use an organic liquid or a high viscosity liquid the colas droplets cannot jump up from the surface basically what we are saying is the viscous forces are too high or the capillary forces are too low viscous forces are too high meaning the dissipation is too high capillary forces are too low meaning uh, the surface energy is too low to induce jumping of these droplets and that's captured by the onusage number if we have uh, what what stab uh, or what thought uh, to be true in the literature is if you have high onusage number um uh, then the viscous forces are too high and capillary forces are too low and you cannot get the droplet to jump away from the surface and so what we thought is can we break that uh, barrier where we can make organic liquids and high viscosity liquids also jump up from the surface and so my my second phd student he came up with this nice strategy where he said why don't we put a ridge between the coalescing droplets so now if you do not have a ridge if you have this super hydrophobic surface and you have two droplets and they're coalescing then the momentum is getting redirected in both the top and the bottom directions if you have something that impedes that uh, uh, propagation of momentum in the bottom direction then majority of the momentum is redirected into the upward direction and the velocity vectors are going to align as these droplets coalesce the velocity vectors are going to align and the droplets would be directed upward and so that can potentially lead to um, uh, you know coalescence of even low surface tension liquids and high viscosity liquids so we did this with water first to see if the, this even leads to a difference or not and we did observe that when you have water droplets coalescing without a ridge they barely jump up from the surface but when you have them coalescing on a ridge you can clearly see that they jump up much higher and this is an indication that the surface energy is uh, getting converted to kinetic energy at a much higher efficiency i think the improvement was almost 500% so um, again there is a lot of physics behind it which i'm uh, skipping and the mathematical scaling analysis Uh, but bottom line what we did was even with uh, oil droplets and uh, high viscosity droplets um, we by having this uh, little ridge here you can make them coalesce and you can get them to jump up uh, from the from the surface um another thing again going back to this counterintuitive hydrophilic and slippery surfaces Uh, they also have in in addition to the biomedical application that i mentioned earlier they also have implications for uh, condensation heat transfer now this is a conventional hydrophilic surface this is the slippery hydrophilic surface 
Now, pretty much everyone who's uh, taken some basic heat transfer co course knows that uh, we have film-wise condensation and drop-wise condensation. So when you have a vapor condensing on the surface, the droplets coalesce and then they can form a film. Uh, and because of the formation of the film, there is a thermal barrier. More vapor cannot condense as easily on the solid surface. And that's why in uh, film-wise condensation, the heat transfer coefficient is low. Now, if we can get drop-wise condensation where the droplets are forming and the droplet is some, somehow getting continuously removed, then vapor has fresh new surface of solid where it can continue to condense. And because of that, in drop-wise condensation, the heat transfer coefficients tend to be higher. But achieving sustained drop-wise condensation is not trivial. So one strategy that we were, uh, um, we proposed was using these slippery hydrophilic surfaces to uh, remove the droplets so that we can have drop -wise, sustained drop-wise condensation. So here I'm showing you a couple of videos. On the left, you have a conventional hydrophilic surface on which you have uh, droplets that are forming but these droplets cannot slide off the surface. These are vertical surfaces, by the way. They're mounted vertically and the vapor is condensing on the surface and the droplets are not able to slide. But if you compare it with this uh, slippery hydrophilic surface, you can sort of see how the droplets are sliding, creating new area for more droplets to condense and uh, that is enhancing the rate of uh, heat transfer. So we have observed that there is a, almost a 500% increase in the uh, rate of uh, the heat transfer coefficient on uh, slippery hydrophilic surfaces compared to these conventional hydrophilic surfaces. So I'll uh, end with this one last thing. Um, so, so far, whatever I talked about is all about uh, solid liquid interfaces. We also make these de-icing coatings where we try to reduce the adhesion of ice, which is a solid to the, to the surface. So if you look at uh, all the de-icing coatings that are available to us as of today, they can be classified as solids and liquids. Solids, they, the, the problem is they have high ice adhesion strength. Liquids, the problem is they have to be reapplied like the, like the liquids, the uh, glycols that get sprayed when we uh, take, uh, take a flight. They have poor durability, so you have to keep on doing it every time, um, so on and so forth. Now, what we said is, can we uh, combine these two properties and, uh, you know, come to a, an intermediate solution. So we started looking at gels, which are between liquids and solids. So we then relied on um, uh, classical adhesion mechanics. This is work coming out of Kendall and others in the 70s, where they looked at uh, the, the, uh, the peeling of uh, soft films from rigid surfaces. And so uh, here the soft film would be the uh, gel and the rigid surfaces are, is ice. And so, um, hello, Jun, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and you can continue. And, and okay. I hope you can try to finish within five minutes. Yep, yep, almost okay. done. So, um, yeah, so the ice addition strength is proportional to the work of addition and the, uh, the shear modulus and the inversely proportional to the square root of the thickness. So basically we made, um, um, uh, we made PDMS gels with different degrees of cross-linking density uh, so that we can control this uh, shear modulus of this uh, coating. And we measured the ice adhesion strength with uh, different uh, materials of different shear moduli and uh, thickness, and we did see that uh, the the you know the response or the ice adhesion strength does follow the predictions from basic uh, adhesion mechanics, and we were able to uh, make materials with low enough shear modulus that have a low enough ice adhesion strength, um, and uh, the the ice adhesion strength is low enough that when an airplane is taking off, the shear forces from the wind past the wing of the airplane are sufficient to displace the ice from the, from the surface. So that's what uh, we had done with this uh, de-icing coating. So with that, I uh, thank you all for your attention. Sorry, I've taken a little too long and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Okay, thank you for your excellent talk. Um,
So if we have any questions from the audience, you can you can type in the, in the, in the box and then I can read it for you. Or if you want, you can unmute yourself directly ask the question. Yeah, right. Wonderful. AG. Yeah, wonderful talk. Good. It's a very inspiring talk. So I actually have a lot of questions, but maybe you know the time limitation here we can discuss later. So one thing, right? So one question for you is uh, for the super uh, amino uh, amino uh, phobic uh, services, right? For all these. How about the, the mechanical durability of the coatings? Yeah, so mechanical durability is always a challenge because we are creating nanostructures and microstructures on the surface. There are strategies to mitigate that, but mechanical durability of all these super hydrophobic, any super repellent surface for that matter, is always a challenge. So it depends on what the application is. Uh, so if we are talking about liquid shearing past the surface, then the shear stresses involved are much lower. And if we can use uh, you know, uh, rigid enough structures, we may still be okay with it. But uh, if we have uh, you know, solid shearing past solids, then we will have to look at strategies like uh, you know, polymers that are elastomers where you can shear very much like glass. You, know, you can shear it and then they can spring back up to their original shape. Um, so on and so forth. And th this is a very, it's an active area of research currently in my group, as well as everyone else who is working in this area. Yeah. Do you have a question for the slippery, uh, for the severe hydrophilic surfaces, right? Is that possible can make it become like a super slippery? I know there's a couple of you know, researches, right? They have a uh, coatings and they have porous coatings with the uh, thin layer of the water like that. And then it became, they can control the, the slippery, right? You can control the droplets moving. For example, you can become slippery, also they can become pink. So just to be clear, on the, sl the slippery hydrophilic surface that I'm talking about, there is no lubricant at all. Many people, what they use is they have a solid surface, they put a lubricant. This is work coming out of uh, Joanna Eisenberg's group at Harvard uh, and many other people who have followed that work. On a solid surface, there is a lubricant and then there is a liquid droplet and that liquid can move. The, the fundamental difference between those types of things and what I presented is these are solid surfaces. There is no lubricant at all. The, the way we are designing this is by having very low chemical heterogeneity and very low uh, physical heterogeneity, meaning very low roughness and ultra high grafting density of the molecules that we are putting on the surface. So because of that, the hysteresis is very low and the solid, the liquids are sliding past. So did I, when you said super slippery, in my mind, these are very, very slippery already. I mean, yeah. the contact angle hysteresis is like maybe two degrees or three degrees and the sliding angles are two or three degrees. So they're already very, very slippery. Cool. Can, can this service apply to different types of droplets, low, low surface tension and high surface tension like that? Oh, oh, so yeah, the, the surfaces, this particular surface that we made is for polar liquids. It is not for non-polar liquids. When we are talking about low surface tension, non-polar liquids like oils, that they will not slide as easily. So uh, this is for polar liquids. We need some sort of a interaction between, a favorable interaction between the liquid and uh, the, the surface. So these are basically peg molecules that are put on the surface, um, polyethylene glycol molecules that are put on the surface. And uh, they're so close together to each other that they're able to allow the water drop, water molecules to hop from one molecule to another molecule. So there's actually um, Jun and I, we are thinking of doing some MD simulations. He's going to support uh, hopefully that will give us more insight into what exactly is going on at the interface. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, Dr. Zhu has questions. You can unmute yourself. Hey, Aron. Yeah, very, very nice talk. Um, well, I have lots of questions, but uh, <laughs> first of all, I just, just follow uh, what uh, Jay was asking about the mechanical durability, right? So you, I think you mentioned about uh, micro nanostructures, right? So that's uh, so it's a problem. But uh, from the nature, right? You, you took the inspiration from the lotus leaf, but it seems the lotus leaf is pretty robust. Yeah. Right? 
So what uh, is the well sort of the gap now between what's the state yeah. of the art and the, the lotus so, state? Any comment? The robustness. Let, let, let's qualify the word robust because uh, it is robust in the sense that it can regrow. It is not robust. If I take a lotus leaf in my hand and just uh, you know do this, like you know, abrade it, we will lose the structures on there. But because it's a living entity, the structures can grow back again. It secretes those wax uh, needles. It continuously does that, and it is it continuously secretes that. And because of that, because it being a living material, it's able to regenerate some of that uh, those properties. So let me actually, I, I have a, a slide here. Let me see if I can, where I summarize some of the, yeah. So, uh, you know, what we really need is we need some sort of a self healing mechanism. That's where we are falling short, um, you know, and I'm trying to currently collaborate with the uh, uh, faculty at uh, Riverside and Boulder <clears throat> to sort of address this issue. We need something that, that has an ability to heal, which natural materials have, but we don't have. It has to be compliant so that we don't have the plastic deformation. If plastic deformation is induced, that's it. That is, there is no coming back uh, after that. We want low aspect ratios. We prefer hierarchical structures so that the bigger features can uh, maintain the durability while the smaller features impart the repellency and preferably monolithic structures rather like a, imagine a sponge, for example, it's a monolithic structure rather than a coating on a surface. So making the structure itself uh, porous, so on and so forth. Th th those are just a few pointers towards um, how to get towards durable surfaces. And these are things that, again, like I said, many people are uh, investigating. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then for this condensation, I think the last part, right? The, the two droplets they come together, right? And they jump up. Uh, so why they jump up? Why don't they shoot uh, forward? Or the, why don't they go to other directions? Ah. So basically, what is happening here? Let me go back to that. Uh, uh, maybe this uh, numerical simulation might help. So what's happening is when two droplets coalesce together, then there, uh, I'll play the left video again. When they coalesce together, there is a capillary bridge that forms first. There is a capillary bridge here. That bridge is going up and down. Okay, and then why not the left and the right? Why? Uh, uh, my question is, why not have an in-plane motion? So these are, we are talking about droplets that are stationary. Mm -hmm. We are talking about if there is a horizontal velocity, yes, it can go in the horizontal direction too. There are droplets where uh, you know, on a condenser where people have shown, let's say this droplet was actually moving from left to right at a certain velocity, comes and, uh, um, you know, hits this droplet, then then you're, you're going to have a motion that's sort of at an angle. You're not going to have a vertical propulsion. But the reason for vertical propulsion is the capillary bridge hits the bottom surface. And once the capillary bridge hits the bottom surface, it's like, jumping off of the surface because there is a normal force, right? If this is, this is, uh, th this is pushing down on the surface, the surface is rigid. So it can, it's like a spring that goes and you're compressing it against the surface and it's jumping up. Now it, you can have some sort of an obstruction here, or you can have horizontal velocity and then the droplet does jump at an angle. In fact, even in the video that I showed that came the first observation of the phenomena, the droplet actually jumps up at an angle, slight angle. So uh, if you see this video, the capillary bridge hits the mm -hmm. surface. And once it hits the surface, it's pushing against I the see. surface and then jumps up. Right. I see. I see. Okay. That's the key. Yeah. Hitting the surface first. Right. And then it bounced back. But then I was not sure why the, the, the region helps here. I, I see it helps dramatically, but I'm not sure why the region so helps. Basically, I mean, I'm, over, I'm going to oversimplify this, but uh, okay. imagine two ping pong balls. You have two ping pong balls on both sides and you're pushing them together. You're creating a ramp for the balls to go up. Instead of just coming together like this, you're creating a ramp for the balls to go up. So if you look at, uh, in, in terms of the mechanism, if you look at this structure here, uh, um, the velocity vectors, you're redirecting them vertically upward. 
if you look at this here, the velocity vectors are going horizontally first and then eventually they get redirected. Let me, let me actually show you screenshots of that. Maybe that will help. So here, the yeah. stop row is uh, the velocity vectors. The left is uh, velocity distribution. The right is the pressure distribution. So if you look at the velocity vectors, they're going horizontally first. And then eventually they get to uh, this point where they start to align. In here, right from the beginning, because you have this obstruction, the velocity vectors are getting redirected upward. And that is favorable for the droplet. So the other thing that happens, that, that's one part. The second thing that happens is, if you look at the pressure distribution, the, the pressure is highest in the middle when, you are, when, it is, when the droplet is trying to push against the surface and jump up, which means the pressure is highest at the middle, there is going to be radial outward flow. And because of that radial outward flow, there is going to be velocity cancellation here. The, the flow is going to go from here to here while the droplet is trying to move up. So there is going to be cancellation of some velocity. Instead, if you look here, the pressure distribution is highest at the bottom. So the, the liquid is trying to push itself up uh, in, the, in the upward direction. So these are the two contributing factors. One is high pressure regions at the, at the bottom and the early symmetry breaking that leads to well, uh, redirection of the velocity vectors. Okay, well, maybe you can do some optimization about the ship, right? This uh, wage ship may not be optimized. So based yeah. on your simulation, yeah. You, you, Absolutely. Yeah. okay. Uh, last a quick question. So the, for the pillar, right? You have the pillar from the ship memory polymer. So how do you fabricate that? Uh, that's, uh, uh, so I don't think I put it in here. So it's a combination of photolithography and uh, deep reactive ion etching. So basically, um, I don't think I have the entire schematic here, but basically. Okay, okay. So you have some mask and then you just etch Absolutely. and then form this sort of, okay. Right. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. I think we have to stop here and, and thank you, Aaron, for your wonderful talk. And thanks for everyone coming through uh, similar. And we're, we'll see you next week. Thank you.